Elizabeth Warren tweets out this image. Elizabeth Warren is building an anti-crypto army, uh, triggering the entire actual real <laughs> army of crypto Twitter. Bankless Nation, happy Friday morning. It is time for the Bankless Friday weekly roll-up where we cover the entire weekly news in crypto, which is always an ambitious endeavor. And here to help us explore that frontier, we are tapping in Anthony Cezano. Anthony, welcome back to the weekly roll-up, man. How's it going? Hey, man, I'm going great. Thanks for having me back on. Lots of news to cover. So I know, Anthony, you are a fellow coffee maxi like me, uh, but it's a little bit late for you to have coffee. I'm sure you already have it, but I just finished my first cup of coffee. So we're going to go through all caffeinated and stuff, all the topics of the week. Arbitrum's first governance vote, which was to sell a billion dollars worth of tokens. Turns out it wasn't actually a vote. Much more drama ensues. You're going to cover all of that news and give our takes as well to unpack all the nuances about that. A brand new frontier gets unlocked in the MEV world. Potentially a new paradigm now unearthed by a validator who sandwiched attacked a sandwich attacker. Uh, we will discuss that and what that means for the MEV landscape. And Liz Warren is gathering her anti-crypto army and everyone is trembling in fear. Right, Anthony? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm de literally trembling in fear right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you guys know the deal. Bankless Nation, make sure to like and subscribe, rate and review wherever you get the podcast, because this is how we get all of this fantastic information scaled out to as many people as possible. This comes out every Friday morning. Uh, and this is, of course, where we cover all the crazy, the crazy, crazy crypto industry. And first, some news out of Bankless that came out on April 1st. You might notice that Anthony Cezano is here, not running out Ryan. That's because Ryan and I have broke up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what was funny about this is how many people actually <laughs> fell for it. So <laughs> yeah, emphasis on the April 1st date. Uh, I, to uh -huh. this day, people are still reaching out to me and be like, man, I can't, I can't believe you guys broke up. Uh, the reason why Ryan is not here is because he is having some very well-deserved time off with his family and kids uh, powered down and getting some software updates <laughs> on some beach somewhere, <laughs> hopefully relaxing. Uh, Ryan and I did not break up. That was an April Fool's joke. Um, and the seriously, the amount of people that got tricked by this April Fool's joke actually warranted me having to bring this up here on the podcast. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I honestly hate April Fool's Day because I have to go through it twice living in Australia. First in Australian April 1st and then second on April 2nd for me, but April 1st for like the for like America and I have to put up with it uh, for 48 hours almost and it just, it's it's not great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so uh, Ryan and I, Ryan will be back uh, next week for all the regularly scheduled programming. Uh, and then quickly before we get into the markets, we actually got uh, some nice perks out for the Bankless Nation here from Coindesk. Consensus is 2023. This is actually not a sponsored message, uh, but they have given the Bankless Nation 15 pro passes to the Consensus Conference. Uh, that is worth $2,200. First come, first serve inside of the Bankless Nation Discord. Uh, and then the next 100 people after that will get 50% off. So I bet you those first 15 tickets are already taken. Uh, but that is one of the benefits of being inside of the Bankless Nation Discord. Uh, so if you want one of those 150% off uh, tickets for a Consensus 2023, jump into the Bankless Nation to fill out the form. This is happening April 26th to 28th at the end of this month in Austin, Texas. Getting into the markets, Bitcoin price starting the week at $27,300, ending the week up, up half a percent. So still green at $27,800. Let me zoom through to the Ether price. Uh, starting the week at $1,800, ending the week at $1,870, up 4.5% on the week. And also the Ether Bitcoin ratio up 4.5% on the week from 0 0.064 to 0 0.067. Anthony, give me a read on the markets. How, how is this last week and last month on the markets from, from your perspective? I think it's led to a lot of renewed optimism uh, about the markets just because these are the highest prices we've seen in, in a little while on both BTC and ETH and people are getting excited again, thinking that, you know, this might be the early innings of a new bull market and, and things like that. I struggle to, to kind of say that. I don't think it's the early innings of a new bull market. I think that ETH and BTC, uh, BTC are still in this range that they've been in for quite a while. And it, it just feels like we're, we're doing this, what people call crabbing. We're basically going sideways for... 
for quite a while. I think that's probably going to be the theme for the, the rest of the year, to be honest. I, I don't expect a new bull market this year, May, maybe next year, right? Um, but generally, yeah, whenever this sort of stuff happens, obviously people are going to get excited, but I think people tend to forget that the, we could go back down to, you know, low 1000s on, on ETH, you know, 20K for BTC or something like that with relative ease and uh, sentiment can change very quickly. But, you know, generally, yeah, I, I don't really pay attention to day-to-day, -day, week to week kind of movements. Um, you know, I, I see people getting excited and I'm like, you know what, it doesn't really bother me either way. Just obviously looking at the long term and 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 thinking obviously that ETH is going to be higher long term. Like I have I have my conviction on that and my thesis around that. But, uh, but yeah, it's interesting just to see different people's takes on it because you've always got the traders who always just trying to trade whatever volatility there is because that's their bread and butter, right? If there's no volatility, they, don't really, they can't really trade uh, and, and there's not really much opportunity. But as soon as the volatility starts, you see all these kind of narratives form and all the sentiment change because people are just trying to trade trade it. People, you know, people, long-term investors are thinking, oh, wow, okay, finally the bull market's back, you know? But yeah, as I said, I, I don't think that, that's the bull market. I just think that we're in that kind of accumulation range that we've seen in previous bear markets where, you know, the diehard buyers are buying, traders are trading, the re retail investors, most of them are not here right now. But eventually, I think that uh, eventually we go back into a bull market and they, and they come back. Yeah, at least in the, the Ether price, we haven't seen these prices since August of 2022. And we are about at that high, that August 2022 mm -hmm. price is kind of the, the resurgence after the three arrows capital liquidation. Uh, and so mm -hmm. before that, it was May of 2022. And that was just in that perpetual uh, down price action that happened for like almost uh, 14 or 15 weeks, which was the, you know, what was 2022 and 2021. Uh, and so we're, we are as high as the big bounce back out of that initial uh, liquidation uh, candle that when Ether went down to just below $900. So it went down to below $900, bounced back up to basically $2,000 in August of 2022. That was pre-merge, yeah. I think it was yeah. based, the merge hype kind of, Got us back. I mean, that was just a narrative people latched mm -hmm. onto. I think as an excuse, <laughs> right. but uh, it, it's 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 funny just seeing like where the price is now. Because if you go back to 2019, a similar thing happened where it kind of bounced back up to uh, a point. Uh, it was like 360 dollars or something, and then after that, it went it went back down uh, to like ETH. Particularly, went from like the bottom to 360 back to like 130 mm -hmm. during 2019. So it was a very volatile year, um, but we we didn't set new lows. Even during the COVID dump, it just went to the previous kind of low. Uh, so I think people generally should be prepared for for that uh, if, it, if it repeats itself um, and not get and not to get too ahead of themselves just because there's a few weeks of positive price action. Yeah. Just a quick uh, comment on the ratio, the Bitcoin Ether ratio. We had a really good week in the ratio after just getting slammed for the past like two or three weeks. So Ether is up 4.5% on the week when uh, it's been like four weeks, four to actually a few months of, of just down price action on, on the ratio. What's, what's your read on the ratio here? It is by far the noisiest chart, I think, in crypto. Uh, getting signal from like the ratio chart is really, really hard. I don't think anyone really trades it on the shorter time frames. It's more of a longer term narrative thing where you're like, okay, right now feels like Bitcoin season or right now feels like ETH mm -hmm. season and people will trade ETH and BTC and then that'll reflect in the ratio. Uh, but generally, yeah, I, I think that looking at maybe month to month is the best time frame for the ratio rather than day to day, week to week, and even kind of shorter than that. Um, because yeah, as I said, it's a very noisy chart and, uh, and you can see that just zooming out on it generally how noisy it can be. And it's funny because it's something that a lot of people use to form narratives and to dunk on each other. Like when it's going up, you know, Ethereum's are dunking on Bitcoiners and when it's going down, Bitcoin is dunking on Ethereum's. <laughs> and it's just a perpetual game of that. But I think what it what it generally just does is it just kind of follows a over the shorter time frames it follows just the that that kind of sentiment that trader sentiment where they're just playing the volatility between BTC you know now it's time to bid BTC or now it's time to bid ETH and other stuff and yeah I, I, I that's why generally I think it's it's very noisy and it's very hard to get a good read on it uh, over the short term but longer term I mean yeah I, everyone should know by now everyone anyone who knows me knows longer term I believe in the flipping and I think that ETH is is definitely going to outperform Bitcoin. But yeah, it's very hard to get signal over the over the shorter time frames. That's for sure. All right, moving into general market uh, talk. Uh, Ethereum is now being held in self custody, the bankless way, and away from exchanges at the highest level since the week the token was <laughs> since the week Ether was introduced eight years ago. So the ratio of Ether 
in self-custody in DeFi and away from exchanges is at all-time highs. And that actually correlates with, for the second month in a row, Uniswap has beat Coinbase in trading volumes. Now, I I remember when uh, Uniswap came out in, in 2019 and that would be like unheard of to, to talk about back in 2019, that Uniswap would be beating Coinbase, the biggest, uh, highest volume centralized exchange that's out there, maybe except for Binance. Uh, and for the second month in a row, Uniswap has beat uh, Coinbase by, by more than a little bit, 45% higher than Coinbase's volume. The best months, uh, Uniswap's best month since, since January 2022. Anthony, give us your read on this. Yeah, I mean, I'm not surprised by this, to be honest, considering how much liquidity and and capital has moved on chain, um, not just on Ethereum layer one, but on these layer twos as well. Uh, And Uniswap obviously dominates there for uh, decentralized exchange trading. Uh, And if you include like even the other decentralized exchanges, not just Uniswap, then it's even much higher than that, right? Uh, Which is which is pretty cool uh, to see to to kind of see that all of them put together just blast away um, Coinbase, which is the second biggest centralized exchange. Still not higher than Binance, but obviously I think Binance is like almost 10 times uh, the trading volume of, of Coinbase. So it's it's quite a bit bigger, maybe not that much these days. I think the, the gap is definitely closing, uh, but there's still there's still a pretty, pretty big gap there. But generally, yeah, if you had told me that this was going to happen so quickly as well, like a couple of years ago, I would have right. probably not believed you because uh, I, I, I centralized exchanges have such a, a grip on on. I guess, uh, volumes and, and liquidity and trading. But in hindsight, looking looking back, it's kind of, well, if liquidity can move as fast as it can move in on crypto rails, then there's no reason why these these things can't happen very quickly. And I think that's what we've seen play out. Uniswap's not the only decentralized exchange that's uh, seeing a lot of volume right now. Trader Joe, which uh, recently deployed, uh, in addition to their Avalanche, their original home base Avalanche deployment, also deployed on Arbitrum a few months ago. Uh, the volume on Arbitrum, and I know you saw these numbers, Anthony, is now three times what it is, a little bit over three times what it is on Avalanche. So uh, in the, the 24-hour uh, volume on Ar- Arbitrum, $177 million measured on March 30th when it was just $58 million on, on Avalanche. And so this is uh, Size Chad tweeting out who's uh, on the Arbitrum team. Looks like Trader Joe is now primarily an Arbitrum Dex. And then he's got the uh, the look at me. I'm the captain now. <laughs> meme. Anthony, give us your take. Yeah, I mean, maybe I'll cop some heat for this, but I had primarily been very bearish on Avalanche uh, because their main thing was the C chain, which was just an EVM chain. And I figured that L2s like Arbitrum and Optimism that were EVM compatible and equivalent would offer a much better experience on the EVM front. Uh, and that would lead to a lot more liquidity and trading and activity than we would see on these other the, these other kind of um, uh, L1s that were EVM compatible. So this doesn't surprise me at all. And it's really funny because I used to see Trader Joe fans and even, even the founder kind of like crapping on a Ethereum for the high fees. Well, now you know they're on the L2s and they're doing better than on Avalanche. So everyone comes to Ethereum. Right? All roads lead to Ethereum, as we like to say. <laughs> yeah, sadly, it really takes a bear market to force the contraction uh, to really make this happen. But um, mm-hmm. that's uh, this is something that that you and I and and many other people in the Ethereum community have been saying that this is this is going to happen one way or another. Uh, and uh, mm-hmm. the, the Ethereum gravitational pull is uh, pretty hard to escape from. Here's a, a tweet out of Eric Wall, moving on to, to different subjects, talking about the NASDAQ correlation between Bitcoin is at an, the lowest point ever since 2021. How do you feel about that? How do you feel about our correlation to NASDAQ being low? What's your sentiment there? I, I don't know if NASDAQ is the best thing to compare with, with Bitcoin to, because Bitcoin's primarily trying not to be a tech play, right? It's uh, like it, the Bitcoin has always told you that the Bitcoin is like tech second. And, f- mm. and first, it's like a, trying to be a reserve currency or trying to be like a digital gold or something like that. So I don't know if it's the best comparison. Um, but generally, yeah, I mean, f- especially in the bear markets, correlations tend to go to, to like one. Uh, everything just correlates with each other because everything's getting sold off with each other and, and indiscriminately, especially during the, the peak fear of bear markets. So to see the correlations come down again usually points to to a more favorable market and you see that play out in the, in the prices. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, maybe comparing it to like the S and P 500 would be better than the NASDAQ. I know people mm. do that a lot. Um, because yeah, I, I generally think based on the narratives, people probably trade Bitcoin more like, uh, uh I don't know, more in, in, in sync with that than the NASDAQ, but 
yeah, I haven't looked too closely at, the, at this sorts of stuff and you can find correlations, but they don't equal causation across anything mm. you want to. So it, it can kind of become a bit of a self-fulfilling narrative at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I do enjoy having the the disconnect because being a non-correlated asset class it was kind of one of the original visions b- between crypto. And I, I think one of the... Uh, where this all of this correlation really came from, and why Bitcoin, even though it's uh, purported to be this like non-sovereign store of value digital gold, it's still traded like a tech stock, is because it's all about liquidity, mm-hmm. right? It's all about Federal Reserve liquidity, and so even though uh, the narrative is that that's what Bitcoin is, uh, it's still a very volatile risk asset that falls right in line mm-hmm. with all with all the tech stocks these days. A little bit more interesting news in the Bitcoin market. Uh, The U.S. government now has 49,000 Bitcoins that it sees from the Silk Road hacker. Uh, This this, this part of the news is is old news. We've known that the government has this. But what is new is that uh, 10,000 Bitcoins and what is assumed to be eventually all 50,000 Bitcoins is going to be sold. Uh, So they transferred basically 10,000, 9,800 Bitcoins to Coinbase uh, and then also the right remaining 40,000 Bitcoins to two new addresses. And uh, that 10,000 Bitcoins was purportedly sold. Last week, we talked about Michael Saylor buying uh, new Bitcoins uh, last week. And uh, turns out he might have been buying the U.S. government's Bitcoins because they were <laughs> selling at the same time he was buying. Uh, the, the bearish news here is that 40,000 Bitcoins, uh, roughly $867 million of Bitcoins, uh, is going to be sold by the United States government over uh, the next few months or perhaps the next few years. And so um, not a not a existential amount of sell pressure, but not a definitely non-zero amount of sell pressure. Anthony, is this signal or is this noise? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of hard to tell because just the nature of markets, you know, there's going to be different points where there's more or less liquidity, right? It was probably much easier for them to sell that BTC over the last couple of months than it would have been to sell it at the end of maybe last year or when volumes kind of go down a lot more than uh, than what they've been over the last couple of months. And I do believe that they said that they were going to aim to sell all of it this year. So it doesn't. I don't know what, what kind of cadence they're going to do. Um, and I don't know how they're going to sell it. I think they're going to sell it via OTC. And it's, it seems like they also got a really, really bad execution price. Um, mm. I saw some some metrics around this saying that they had sold it at like an almost 10% discount to what the spot price was on the days that they basically said Oof. that they sold it. Yeah. So I, I don't know what happened there, whether they just really wanted to get rid of it. Um, I don't know how, I mean, it's the US government, right? They can, they can literally print the money <laughs> to buy the BTC. So I don't know how sensitive they are to, to that. Uh, but but generally, yeah, I, I, it, was, it was a bit of a weird thing that, that kind of came out when they were published their report that they said they did they so I believe it was a yeah 10% discount to what the spot vol- uh, spot price was at the time that they sold Man, yeah, United States really, uh, really paper handing the, the bitcoins here. <laughs> One funny uh, quip I saw about this is that here's a tweet from Joe McCann. Just so we're clear, United States regulators sent Coinbase a Wells notice, while the U.S. government also sent two hundred million dollars of Bitcoin to said sell that said Bitcoin. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing really real here, but it's just kind of funny to see these uh, juxtapositions. Yeah, I mean, the juxtaposition is definitely funny, but I don't think there's any signal in this because no. there are different departments of the US government, right? And they're not all talking to each other all the time. And at the end of the day, they can, like a regulator can still send a Wells notice and then they can still use the service to, to do whatever they want. Uh, and maybe, <laughs> I don't even I don't even know if the timing was, was lined up on this either. And I think people are, are, are well aware at this stage that the SEC is a bit of a rogue agency within the US government anyway, and they just seem to be doing their own thing. So yeah, but the US government, it's absolutely massive. Like you can't just say that they're all kind of like in sync with each other. They all know what they're doing. They all talk to each other. No, I don't. I don't think so. I think that they went to Coinbase because they're like Coinbase is a U.S. company. They're going to be able to process this for us. We can trust them to do it, you know, in a safe and secure manner. And uh, and they're regulated too. I, I don't mm-hmm. think probably there is some rule that the, the U.S. can't sell this Bitcoin to any unregulated institution uh, mm-hmm. or that you know it's not like they're going to. It's not like they're going to send it to Binance, right? <laughs> yeah, that would be even even funnier if they sent it to Binance after the CFTC that be did that massive kind of thing a lawsuit against Binance, right? So yeah, it, I think it was like the the just the the logical spot for them to go to, like Coinbase, right? Yeah, right. All right, uh, that is the market section. Coming up next, we got to talk about this Arbitrum governance drama. 
Uh, we also, we talked a, a lot last week about Elizabeth Warren, and that was before she released her War on Crypto campaign. So we're going to talk about Elizabeth Warren a little bit more. Also got to talk about Elon Musk and Doge because that is in the news cycle this week. CZ has an Interpol rumor. We're going to have to unpack that. All of this news and more is coming right after we talk to some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible. You know Uniswap as the world's largest DEX with over $1.4 trillion in trading volume, but it's so much more. Uniswap Labs builds products that lets you buy, sell, and use your self-custody digital assets in a safe, simple, and secure way. Uniswap can never take control or misuse your funds the bankless way. With Uniswap, you can go directly to DeFi and buy crypto with your card or bank account on the Ethereum Layer 1 or Layer 2s. You can also swap tokens at the best possible prices on Uniswap.org. And you can also find the lowest floor price and trade NFTs across more than seven different marketplaces with Uniswap's NFT aggregator. And coming soon, you'll be able to self-custody your assets with Uniswap's new mobile wallet. So go bankless with one of the most trusted names in DeFi by going to Uniswap.org today to buy, sell, or or swap tokens and NFTs. Kraken has been a leader in the crypto industry for the last 12 years. Dedicated to accelerating the global adoption of crypto, Kraken puts an emphasis on security, transparency, and client support, which is why over 9 million clients have come to love Kraken's products. Whether you're a beginner or a pro, the Kraken UX is simple, intuitive, and frictionless, making the Kraken app a great place for all to get involved and learn about crypto. For those with experience, the redesigned Kraken Pro app and web experience is completely customizable to your trading needs, integrating key Key trading features into one seamless interface. Kraken has a 24-7, 365 client support team that is globally recognized. Kraken support is available wherever, whenever you need them, by phone, chat, or email. And for all of you NFTers out there, the brand new Kraken NFT beta platform gives you the best NFT trading experience possible. Rarity rankings, no gas fees, and the ability to buy an NFT straight with cash. Does your crypto exchange prioritize its customers the way that Kraken does? And if not, sign up with Kraken at kraken.com com slash bankless. Bankless Nation, we are back with this Arbitrum drama. We're going to start with talking about Arbitrum. Here's a tweet that really just kind of raised the alarm, if you will, about this. Uh, Arbitrum Foundation made a proposal, AIP1, to allocate 750 million ARB tokens for admin and operational costs, but Arbitrum holders voted against it. Now they said that the vote was just a formality and they have already spent 50 million tokens of the proposed 750 million Arbitrum tokens that the foundation was going to receive. And this tweet from Eden Au concludes, your vote is not a vote. So here is the snapshot. 76.6% uh, of uh, voters voted against this Arbitrum Improvement Proposal Framework AIP-1, basically the genesis of the Arbitrum DAO. This is a proposal created uh, and originally proposed by, I'm guessing, the Arbitrum Foundation or at least initial core DAO members that really would just like set in stone what Arbitrum would look like. And in this DAO proposal, 750 million Arbitrum tokens was going to be sent to the Arbitrum Foundation and that the Arbitrum Foundation would be able to just more or less administer these funds as they see fit. Uh, and so this uh, caused some concern uh, with the Arbitrum DAO and the Arbitrum community because these tokens were sent and then a portion of these tokens were sold and then other portions of these tokens were sent around uh, regardless of the status of this vote. Uh, and so people were concerned, like, well, like, wh why, why are you guys selling tokens? We, hadn't, we didn't even approve this thing. In fact, this proposal ended a few days ago very clearly against. So 76% uh, voted against it, 12.5% voted for it, and the remainder voted to abstain. Uh, and then as it turns out, the Arbitrum Foundation and Arbitrum team says, no, this AIP number one wasn't actually a proposal to begin with. Uh, it was actually just a ratification process. This is the way that it's going to be, regardless of the DAO vote. And everything after this is up to Arbitrum governance. But this first initial proposal is actually not a proposal. It is a ratification process. It's just a formality, if you will. But the things in this proposal is going to be the way that it is, regardless of the way that the DAO votes. Uh, and so, uh, sorry about it, 
is the way that the community is perhaps interpreting the communications from the Arbitrum DAO. Uh, Anthony, I know you and I both have our perspectives on this, uh, and maybe to start this conversation off, I think I believe you are uh, an Arbitrum investor. I am not an Arbitrum investor, and so those are our disclosures. Anthony, give, give us your take uh, as to the events. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's there's a lot to unpack here. I think that people didn't realize at first, uh, but I'll try and keep it short and sweet just to summarize my thoughts on it. So I think what people got most upset about when it came to this was the poor communication and the lack of transparency. So this stemmed from the fact that, as you said, this AIP was only put forward as a formality. All of the decisions in here were made before the token went live and before the DAO went live. So essentially all that was happening was that the decisions that had already been made were being formalized and ratified. It was silly for this to even go to a vote, to be honest, because it set the obviously wrong expectations and it confused people and and it, it was just really poor communication overall um, from uh, the foundation here. And people re- also need to understand that the foundation is something that was spun up as a separate entity to Offchain Labs, which are the original developers of the Arbitrum network. So uh, Offchain Labs and the Arbitrum Foundation are completely separate uh, legally, logically, um, and they had to be. And the foundation is the entity that launched the DAO and, uh, and the token, basically. So what they did was they said that we're going to, you know, allocate 750 million ARB tokens to the foundation uh, at, at Genesis, basically. And we made and they made that decision before anything was live, before the DAO was live or anything like that. And then we're going to use that for various activities. So 10 million ARB tokens was sold to cover foundation-related expenses. And this is where another thing that people didn't understand. Off-chain labs can't fund the foundation because they have to be separate. So any expenses that the foundation incurred needed to be covered in some other way. And they chose to sell um, $10 million worth of tokens or more than 10 million, 10 million ARB tokens to fund that. And these expenses included all the legal expenses to set up the foundation, the DAO, the token, everything around that, and all the administrative expenses, people expenses, everything. It was, I think, three to $4 million um, just, just for that, right? And not including it, all, all the uh, future expenses that are going to be incurred. And then they also sent 40 million ARB tokens to Wintermute, which is a market maker, to do market making things. Now, this was not um, a gift. It was a loan, basically. So they didn't send it to them and say, here, I have 40 million tokens. No, it's loaned to them at some... Uh, uh, at some kind of like uh, interest rate, maybe there's, maybe it's zero percent, um, and then it's also uh, it has a term, so maybe it's a year, maybe it's two years. But that is supposed to be used for market making on exchanges, whether they be centralized or decentralized. Now that stuff wasn't communicated. That's where the lack of transparency and the crappy comms came from. Uh, that that kind of stuff wasn't communicated initially, and then the community hit back and they did. Uh, Arbitrum did communicate this, and uh, actually yesterday or even today, I, I, I don't know if it was today or yesterday. Um, uh, when we, from when we're recording this, Arbitrum posted a bunch of new uh, text. So they po- posted a transparency report that covers everything that the foundation did uh, before the DAO and token was launched. And they published AIP 1.1 and 1.2, which are actually going to be propos- real proposals that ARB token holders have a say on and the results of the vote is going to be binding. It's not just going to be a formality. It's going to be a real proposal. So as I said, like my general thoughts on this was that I think people overreacted. I think that it was uh, it was uh, just a, a communications issue here, uh, and obviously a bit of a lack of transparency as well. And um, I think there was a lot of things that people just didn't have the context around, uh, and that's why they they're in uproar about it. Uh, and I think since then, as I said, there's this new thread from Arbitrum that came out that alleviates a lot of these concerns and also publishes the the, the much needed transparency along with these new AIPs and. Also going forward, the Arbitrum governance has the ability to change the terms now of what mm-hmm. of what the foundation originally decided on. So they can say, if, if Arbitrum governance wants to, they can say, well, no, we think 750 million tokens is too much for the foundation. We're going to take uh, a portion of those back and we're going to put it back into the Arbitrum uh, treasury and they're going to stay there. So th- those sorts of things can happen from, from now. But yeah, the drama was really around AIP1. And as I said, it should never have gone to vote to begin with because it wasn't really going to a vote it was a, it was a formality and it, that was uh, i don't know what happened there i don't know why that was was the case but that's uh that that was my overall opinion on it yeah i i, I agree with everything i really think that 
the cause for frustration is not because of Arbitrum or the choices that they made, but because of the legal hurdles and legal gymnastics that they are forced to go through as a result of the legal environment here in the United States. So like, once again, I'm going to point the finger back at just like the regulatory environment that forces this like foundation structure that also is very, what makes it very, very delicate about like, how did the tokens come into existence? Who gave the tokens to the foundation? Like all of these things are very Mm -hmm. careful and very delicate. And that forces, that really constrains and constricts uh, these these organizations to be able to do what's best for the community and the protocol. And as a result of that complexity, they had this miscommunication where they said like, hey, we're going to ratify this thing, but also because of the regulatory environment, the, you know, it doesn't matter, we're going to have to do what, we're going to have to do this anyways because we are constrained in our choices here. So the first, uh, before this, uh, th- there's two parts that we're going to cover here. You, you touched on it a little bit, but there's a, an April 3rd Twitter thread that Arbitrum put out. And they say, thanks for all the uh, feedback and all the participation on, on the DAO. Uh, it is likely the AIP one is likely not going to pass the ratification. But again, it's already the, the decisions being made are already made. Uh, before we dive in, we want to clarify why 10 million ARB tokens were sold by the uh, Arbitrum Foundation. Foundation is a separate entity to Offchain Labs. It was established with no funds, no money. The 10 million ARB mm-hmm. tokens were sold to Fiat to fund pre-existing contracts and pay for the near-term operating costs. For example, the $3.5 million setup costs that's outlined in AIP1, the cost to set up the foundation so it can do its job. Uh, the foundation does not uh, exist to sell tokens, only sold enough to fund its current operating expenses and has no near-term plans to sell more tokens. Uh, and so that's where the $10 million uh, came from, the, or excuse me, the 10 million tokens came from. And then also, like you said, uh, the remaining 40 million ARB tokens has been allocated, what they say, as a loan to a sophisticated actor in the financial market space. That's Wintermute. That's a market maker. Uh, by mm-hmm. the way, any ARB token holder uh, is highly interested in Wintermute having these 40 million tokens because this means that what they're what a market maker does is increase the liquidity of the spot price of the arb token so if there is some big fund out there who is unallocated to arb yet they are bullish on arb they be as a result of this liquidity that's coming from wintermute can buy arb tokens without moving the price too much and so it increases the scope of external actors who can purchase and put ARB tokens on their balance sheet because they're bullish ARB because there's sufficient liquidity for them to do that. Additionally, on the other side of things, for everyone who got the airdrop and wants to sell because they just want to sell and do that, it also increases the liquidity of sellers. So they don't also move the price downwards. And so I think the the community who might be frustrated by this should consider like this increasing the liquidity of R by transferring these forty million dollar tokens to a forty million tokens to a market maker. It's bullish on both sides because people get to exit who want to exit without disturbing the price, and it opens up the scope of funds to enter, and they otherwise wouldn't if it w- if there wasn't sufficient liquidity there. So this is the, this first mm-hmm. tweet thread. That's my explanation for like why we should be accepting this forty million transfer to Wintermute. This also happened, by the way, with with OP and Optimism. They also sent tokens to Wintermute. This is a pretty normal practice. Uh, and mm-hmm. and then again, the the ten million dollars that were sold ahead of time. It's unfortunate that it was done in this way and communicated in this way. But like. Uh, anyone who is, in my opinion, questioning the incentives of the Arbitrum team and Arbitrum org, I think, is really kind of missing the point. Um, mm-hmm. the, and so here's another tweet thread that came out last night uh, at 9.30 p.m. my time, my Montenegrin time. Uh, I think that's um, 3.30 in the afternoon uh, Eastern time. Uh, they said, the foundation will not move any of the remaining 700 million tokens in the administrative budget wallet until an acceptable budget and smart contract lockup schedule has been approved by the DAO. And so the Arbitrum org is responding to a lot of the feedback, regardless of whether it's justified or not, they are responding to the feedback and the criticisms from the community. So like you said, uh, Mm -hmm. Anthony, I'm just repeating what you said, three new documents have been posted, a transparency report about the foundation's initial setup, AIP 1.1 lockup budget and transparency and AIP 1.2 amendments to the current founding documents. 
Uh, and so this is just them reacting to the, the wants and desires of the community. So just some more details on these reports. The transparency report describes actions taken to get the DAO up and running. As these have already occurred, the DAO will not be asked to vote on them. However, the DAO can change these parameters and futures uh, and, and roles via future AIPs. So that's the first document. AIP 1.1 proposes important restrictions on the foundation spending, including a smart contract enforced lockup schedule that releases linearly over four years years, further adjustable by the DAO. And AIP 1.2 uh, also proposes uh, well-defined budgetary, budgetary principles and categories and mandated transparency reports. Uh, these have been posted on the community forum and will be available for feedback for 72 hours before a planned week-long snapshot vote. So the culmination of this thing is more transparency and more agency by the DAO, yet the initial, initial 1.1 or AIP1 is still going to go through because that just needs to happen for legal purposes and for foundation cost purposes and also just because it's, in my opinion, the correct thing to do. Any further thoughts on that, Anthony? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think that you covered most of it. And I also think that the Arbitrum or Foundation had already had plans to post these things uh, and the transparency report and everything. Anyway, it's just that they seem to have been following some kind of defined uh, standard operating procedure that they came up with pre-DAO and they just did it and they probably didn't put too much thought into it. They didn't think the community would would go into such a, of an uproar. And now that they saw that that was uh, probably the, the wrong way of thinking about it, they've... Uh, uh, they've come back strong, I think. And I'm someone who likes to judge people on what they do after they make a mistake, right? So uh, they made the mistake and now they seem to be really killing it in, in making up for it, in my opinion. I, I really do like the transparency report. I've read through it. It covered all of the, I think, questions people had and these new AIPs, which are, as I said, actually going to be binding as per the way token holders vote. I think we'll go a lot to restoring confidence in the Arbitrum DAO. Yeah, I 100% I agree. And, and also, like, sometimes just DAO culture, <laughs> the, the foundation <laughs> is set up with capital so that they can, the, the purpose of the foundation, so, like, I actually want to go in, into this a, a little bit. The purpose of the foundation, as they've stated, is that for the sake of operational and administrative efficiency, a separate account controlled by the Al uh, Arbitrum Foundation will be created. 750 million ARB tokens will be transferred to the administrative budget for the purpose of, purposes of making special grants, reimbursing applicable service providers for the total setup costs, and further funding uh, out of the administrative budget wallet shall require approval of an AIP uh, from the Arbitrum DAO pursuant to the AIP process. The idea, mm -hmm. we, we want, I, at least me speaking on behalf of the Arbitrum community, we want the Arbitrum Foundation to be able to fund projects, fund people, put money in people's hands without having to be burdened by an encumbering like DAO governance process. I think it shouldn't be a shock, but like we have not figured out DAO governance. We have not figured out streamlined and efficient capital allocation and functioning by DAOs. Sadly, centralization still works in this industry, and the people who make up the Arbitrum Foundation and the point of the Arbitrum Foundation is to be able to move faster than what is would be a dysfunctional DAO because, I mean, I'm just assuming that this DAO would be at dysfunctional from the beginning because they kind of all are. So in my opinion, it would behoove the Arbitrum community to put power and control in the hands of a select few people controlled by governance if they ever do something wrong so that they can move faster and make better decisions than the DAO can as a whole versus mere snapshot vote. That's my like hot take on the matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I mean... DAOs, when they first start out, need a lot of stewarding by, you know, maybe the original team and a foundation that's been spun up. It can't just be, hey, everyone, we've got a DAO, now go to your own devices. There have been projects that have done that before, and I don't think they've been very successful. So I think the projects that will succeed the most when trying to become a DAO is uh, they they stick to it, right? They, they steward it along. But I think for legal reasons, uh, the foundation gets spun up in order for them to, to enable them to do that, right? And th this means that like off-chain labs is 
is just one actor in the DAO. The foundation is another actor of the DAO. And then you have the community delegates that are other actors. So you can have those separations there. People will criticize that and say that it's a lot of decentralization theater where they're just doing it because of the regulatory environment. And it's like, okay, well, that's that can be true. But at the same time, it can also lead to better outcomes later on where it actually does become truly decentralized. And you have a really vibrant community of stakeholders that uh, that operate the DAO and that, and that kind of submit proposals and people vote on it and, and they care about doing what's best for the Arbitrum protocol and the Arbitrum ecosystem. So yeah, I think both things can be true true uh, at, at the same time. Just one last uh, rabbit hole during this whole thing. Since we're talking about the Arbitrum Foundation, I just want to put a little bit more color on it. Um, so here is the AIP-1, the initial proposal, the ratification thing that kind of um, triggered the ire of the DAO community members. Some some DAO community members, the very loud ones. Uh, and here's a, here's a part of it that I want to just focus on is like the structure of the foundation and how it works. So as a Cayman Islands foundation, the Arbitrum Foundation is required to have at least one director responsible for the management and arbitration, uh, arb operation of the Arbitrum Foundation, in particular approving and entering into contractual arrangements on behalf of the Arbitrum Foundation. Once again, a thing that a DAO cannot do is enter contractual relationships. That's why we need a foundation. Um, so the directors, the three directors who I'm about to list, are responsible for ensuring that AIPs, Arbitrum Improvement Pro Proposals, do not, one, compromise their fiduciary duties owed to the uh, Arbitrum Foundation, two, violate the Arbitrum Foundation's amended and restated memorandum of association or bylaws, the Arbitrum DAO original constitution, or the AIP process, or any other laws or regulations of applicable jurisdictions, making sure the Arbitrum DAO doesn't violate laws, uh, and then three, cause the Arbitrum Foundation to be in breach of or in violation of any contracts, agreements, or other ar arrangements. So the foundation is saying, hey, Dow, uh, if we sign a contract, no proposal will can go through the ratification process that makes us break the law or violate a contract. Uh, so like kind of just like regular legal stuff. So the initial directors of the Arbitrum Foundation are Campbell Law, Edward Noyens, who I believe is this individual, Web3 Directorship and DAO Services. I believe this is just like a trad DAO delegate, like a foundation delegate, if you will, somebody who's like disconnected and independent uh, and like provides these services. I'm assuming this, he's based in the Caymans. Uh, and so I'm assuming this is just a service that this man provides and is uh, well trusted in the space. Uh, and then uh, lastly, uh, Ani Banerjee, who I also don't know, but I think. Oh, I, I couldn't find out who this person was. Anyways, three mm -hmm. initial directors of the Arbitrum Foundation who are like custodians, if you will, of, of the org. Um, the Arbitrum DAO may remove or elect the Arbitrum Foundation's directors or expand or reduce the number of directors at any time pursuant to the non-constitutional AIP. So that is the foundation. And then there's also a security council a committee of 12 members of a multi-sig wallet, which has the ability to perform both emergency and non-emergency uh, actions, further detailed in section three of the Arbitrum DAO. Uh, and here these people are. Mo Dong, co-founder of the Seller Network, Harry Kalodner, uh, Arbitrum Off-Chain Labs member, uh, Diane Dai, co-founder of Dodo at DEX, uh, Caleb Lau, software engineer at Etherscan, Ed Felton, one of the co-founders of Off-Chain Labs, Brian Pellegrino, uh, co-founder and CEO of Layer Zero Labs, uh, and then uh, Patrick McNabb, co-founder of Mycelium slash TracerDAO, uh, Justin Drake, we all know who Justin Drake is, uh, Bartek from Layer 2 Beat, Rachel Bowsfield, software engineer at Offchain Labs, Patricia Warthaler, uh, the, the Mr. Poap himself, uh, and mm -hmm. then also Yoav mm -hmm. Weiss, security researcher at the Ethereum Foundation. All of these security members, uh, security council members are paid $5,000 a month in ARP tokens to like secure the foundation and do their roles. Uh, and so that is a foundation. That's how it works. That's how it's structured. And so here is uh, my rationale for why people got so upset by this. And <laughs> it's because <laughs> crypto people love drama. Uh, and so this was a thing 
to be upset about. And so people decided, elected to get upset about it. And so here is a meme of, uh, it's a Simpsons meme. It's just like a co- It doesn't actually make sense if I try and explain this out loud. But the idea <laughs> is just like, crypto Twitter's addicted to drama. Uh, and this is Lisa Simpson drinking coffee and she's just like addicted to coffee. I was like, crypto people love drama. And so this is 1 billion tokens or $1 billion mm-hmm. worth of tokens getting sold by Arbitrum. Like, very hot thing to tweet and like very easy to like pile on to. Uh, and so my explanation for why this turned into such a big deal is like one part, the communications could have been a little bit better. And second part, it was really easy to turn this into a very viral, like dramatic event. So that's my explanation mm-hmm. as to why this turned into what it was. Moving on. Elizabeth Warren tweets out this image. Elizabeth Warren is building an anti-crypto army, uh, triggering the entire actual real <laughs> army of crypto Twitter. Anthony, uh, what was your reaction when you saw this this tweet from Elizabeth Warren? So I, the funny thing about this is I come from, uh, at this from like a totally non-US political view because I don't live in America. I don't follow US politics very closely at all, to be honest. Um, and I know I only know who Elizabeth Warren is because of her crypto takes and because everyone <laughs> on crypto Twitter is always complaining about her. Um, but I, I know what her kind of like stances are and her policies are after looking into it a bit. And I saw this and I'm like, you know what? This is actually going to be popular with her base. And this is probably going to win her some votes given that right now a lot of people outside of crypto don't have a positive view of crypto because one they probably lost money in the bull market right a lot of people were came in at the tail end of the bull market and then lost money in in the bear once the the, the bull market just kind of collapsed uh and two they saw a lot of other stuff like Terra collapsing last year and ftx the biggest fraud since basically uh what um uh, bernie madoff right so I, I think that this resonates with a lot of people but as you said like it, this triggered like everyone in crypto and the actual crypto army kind of responded to it if you actually look at all the replies to this tweet she just gets ratioed a million different times as you keep scrolling <laughs> down and it's it's kind of it's kind of hilarious to see all the replies but um, yeah, that, that was my first kind of reaction where I was like, look, she isn't trying to appeal to anyone in crypto at all. Obviously, she knows that this isn't going to resonate with them. Her, her team knows it's not going to resonate with them, but she's trying to appeal to her existing base and any potential new voters. And as far as I can tell, she's in a relatively safe seat as well. And she, she doesn't actually have to work that hard to retain it from what I've seen. So yeah, again, this could resonate with those people uh, pretty strongly. Yeah, how many tweets did this get? This got 1,500 likes, and then this one response, <laughs> uh, Coin, Coin Bureau, the other uh, very big YouTube channel uh, about crypto says, imagine thinking that building an anti-crypto army is going to win you votes. 4,300 likes. The, uh, what, what I find funny about that is that it actually is going to win her votes with certain people, and, with and, certain and people, it's not but, going... But what you said is like, it's going to be very popular with her base. Her base was already going to vote for her. Y- yes, yes, but... The people that weren't going to vote for her in crypto, doesn't matter what she does, right. they're not going to vote Fair for enough. her, right? Yeah. So for her, it's like the people, she doesn't have to be friendly to crypto people because right. they're never voting for her. Even if she is friendly to them, they disagree with her about a lot of other things too. Because she has a lot of very, uh, I guess, like you would call them progressive policies or very, very like, I don't want to say far left policies, but like they're pretty on that side of the spectrum. And I feel like in crypto, you get a lot of centrists generally from what I've I've noticed, um, and and depending on where you go, there are uh, a, 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 a lot of people, a lot of crypto people, um, define themselves as libertarians. They're not voting for Elizabeth Warren, right? <laughs> so right. to her, it's like I'm pissing off people that are already pissed off at me and hate right. me. So who cares, right? <laughs> yeah, it's just increasing the polarity. My big like critique here, in addition to just like, hey, crypto is not what you think it is. It's just like people don't like to stand for things in opposition of something, like. What do you believe? I believe in the anti-crypto movement. Like that's that's what you stand for? Like it's an like it's it's weird to stand for something in opposition to something else. Like it's not you're just like letting yourself be defined by the world around you. Anyways, mm-hmm. uh <laughs> Of course. It's uh, like someone running on like anti-technology army or like anti this army, anti that army. Like that's, it's actually weird for a democratic politician to be running on an anti kind of 
I guess, progressive thing, right? I just, that, at least from my point of right. view, it, it's usually, you know, from my point of view, the conservatives that would be anti-something because they want to keep the status quo. I don't know. It's different, I know, in the US compared to Australia. I'm probably coming at this for, with an Australian view on, on politics. Uh, but yeah, when I saw that, I was like, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a bit weird. It's a bit weird. Uh, I read an article. I don't have it up here, but this article says... Um, <laughs> Elizabeth Warren starting to recruit conservative Senate Republicans to her anti-crypto cause. Also getting some early positive vibes from bank lobbyists who also want to rein in digital asset startups, partnerships with GOP lawmakers. That's the Republican Party, Elizabeth Warren's, the opposite of Elizabeth Warren's party. Mm -hmm. uh, partnership with GOP lawmakers reflects broader focus uniting progressives and conservatives, watchdog groups, and bankers wanting to prevent the growth of crypto. So like it's it's interesting like this reaction is like uh, attracting bankers and conservatives like I'm anti bank not necessarily anti conservative but Elizabeth Warren certainly is anti conservative and so it's it's mm -hmm. interesting to see like who she's aligned with uh, that is adjacent and very different from her actual typical base. Uh, she also just gave us the very easy <laughs> opportunity to make this meme, which is Bankless is building a pro crypto army. And that was just way mm -hmm. too easy. And we just got as many likes as Elizabeth Warren. So I'll count that as a victory. Uh, and then here's uh, perhaps like a slightly mean meme, but this is like, okay, grandma, let's get you to bed. And the grandma saying- Well, you know, it's mean, but it's so accurate, right? Like the average age of the of, of a US politician is, is very old. It's, it's not exactly something that would lend itself to being progressive generally on technology because typically uh, a lot of the uh, older folks don't understand it because they didn't grow up with it and it's a lot it, it get, becomes hard for them to wrap their head, head around it mm -hmm. so and I think it's not just technology it's it's a lot of things and I don't think that's a controversial opinion to have where the too many old people run the country and I, I actually saw someone say this on Twitter I don't know who it was but they said it a little while ago where they said we don't trust like the old people in a lot of other jobs but we trust them to run the country like, like, how does that work, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, since we're talking about Twitter drama, let's move on a little bit to Elon Musk, who turned, if Bankless uh, listeners who are viewing the YouTube will notice that in the top left corner in, of the screen here, there is no longer a little Twitter bird icon, the little blue bird icon. There is a Doge icon. Uh, Elon Musk, uh, this last week, uh, replaced the Twitter bird with Doge. Uh, and then he tweets out a very old a screenshot of some old tweets between him and uh, Wall Street Bets chairman Twitter account uh, talking about some one of the original uh, conversations about Elon Musk needing a new platform. This was in like the deplatforming conversations way back when. And chairman, uh, Wall Street Bets chairman just says, just buy Twitter. And then he follows up saying, and then change the bird logo to a doge. And then Elon Musk follows up saying, ha ha, that would be sick. Fast forward to today, I, I, he did it. <laughs> he did it. He changed the Twitter icon to Doge. Anthony, you use Twitter a lot. <laughs> what are your thoughts? <laughs> uh, um, it's not going to save Twitter's revenue. <laughs> <laughs> well, you um, know what is going to save? The price of Doge, which pumped a whopping 4%. 4% up in Doge. Well done, Elon. Well done. Pumping Doge. I, yeah, just um, he's got this weird fascination with Doge that just doesn't seem to be going away for him. And I don't know. I, it kind of felt like a late April Fool's joke that kind of just stuck around for some reason. Uh, I saw it. And I was like, whatever. I'm not, I, I wasn't even surprised, honestly. I was like, you know, this is just Elon doing Elon things. But at the same time, it's like, bro, I think you should be focusing on Twitter's massively declining revenue and uh, and hoping you can kind of save that, right? <laughs> yeah. Moving on to uh, actually some other, some further Twitter drama, actually, to really uh, round this out. This is the, the last big news of the week before we get into to the regular old news. Kobe has done this in the past. This is uh, Kobe, the, the Twitter account, uh, famous crypto Twitter personality. Uh, we've had him on Bankless for episode number 100. Tweets out this hash, very long hash. Uh, and uh, this is uh, uh, an activity that he's engaged in, in in the past a number of times where he just tweets out a hash and it's basically using Twitter as like a public timestamping tool. Someone, uh, oddly enough, was able to decode this hash uh, and this hash read Interpol red notice for CZ. Uh, a red notice is a very big deal. It's basically saying all the countries that abide by this agreement uh, 
arrest this man when you see him. So it's like an international warrant for your arrest. Mm -hmm. So Interpol red notice for CZ, uh, perhaps a very big deal. Uh, BNB token uh, dropped like 10% on this news, causing a bunch of liquidations. Bitcoin and Ether dropped on this news. Uh, and someone, uh, so well, then crypto Twitter started to ask like, okay, how did they hack and how did they uh, decode this hash? Because the point of the hash is for it to be hidden unless you know the secret. The secret is Interpol Red Notice for CZ, but only Kobe, in theory, would be able to decode this hash using that seed phrase, just using that seed. So it's a way for him to like timestamp in public a statement, but not actually reveal the statement. So as a result of this news, a lot of people started to get really fearful. Uh, what, did CZ go into jail? Is Binance being taken down? Uh, and so Kobe tweets out, uh, I have posted SHA-256 hash of rumors over 20 times in the last year without the secret being revealed. The point of a hash commitment scheme is so that no one is supposed to be able to read them until after the secret is revealed. Uh, and so one of the, the big news that's happened is that CZ had to tweet out that this was just FUD, latest FUD, only spread by crypto news outlets, likely planted, sponsored by another exchange, uh, very petty, hurts the industry and hurts themselves, basically completely denying all FUD. And then Kobe presents another tweet thread that says, hey, this secret of this hash was not supposed to be revealed. Kobe says that he uh, discussed this rumor hand with a handful of possible people and someone that he discussed this rumor with and implicitly shared the seed with leaked the seed to cause a stir at Kobe's expense, removing the context of the rumor. Highly doubt any theories about brute forcing the, the hash are, are true since no others have uh, been broken, including the one I've posted after the other hash. Uh, Anthony, open and shut story. It's already concluded. CZ apparently is denying all rumors about a, a red, red uh, Interpol red notice. Um, what's your take here? This literally all happened while I was sleeping. Um, oh, really? So I woke up. Yeah, the entire, the entire thing while I was sleeping. So the initial hash that Kobe put out, the someone decoding it, the price going like down, CZ tweeting about it, and then waking up to Kobe apologizing. That's li like literally in the eight hours I was asleep, this all happened. So for me, it was like, I, okay, this is just drama that I completely missed. I don't have to worry about this. But I mean, it's just, it, it goes to show that like even trolling, like uh, uh, at, at this scale, I guess, can be quite, quite damaging. But I'm not, I don't think I blame Kobe for it, to be honest, mm -hmm. considering mm -hmm. that it, this is kind of his brand brand right to just troll and uh obviously as he said um uh, breaking it or brute forcing it is quite difficult um even if it's unsalted so uh, someone in his circle kind of i guess i wouldn't say betrayed him but like leaked the information um but yeah i think people with a large following generally forget like how much of an impact that can have uh i know you know sometimes we can forget as well depending on what we kind of tweet out and what we put out there so and, and it's kind of hard for for people to to um uh, remember that sometimes and yeah i think that these moments are humbling for those people yeah but i even wouldn't say that like kobe, kobe was even doing that he wasn't trolling i think his the idea was like he was trying to get a flex so that if a red notice was actually issued he would be able to say like oh i learned this at this point in time it's like shame on kobe's yeah trusted okay. friend that that leaked that information like that's really where the blame should be should be placed but we just don't know who that is yeah yeah and it sounds like neither does yeah kobe. yeah no i can i can see that but I, I mean the reason why i say trolling is because kobe always does that like he's he's yeah, always shoot yeah. posting on twitter and trolling yeah. so it could have been it could have been just both right he could have right. been like oh it was a, it was a troll or, or, or you know it was i was right basically yeah all right, fam, coming up next, we're going to get an update on the Euler exploit. That story is concluded right after we talk about it. Uh, and there's uh, some drama in the MEB Flashbots world. There's a bunch of raises, so perhaps more jobs coming our way. And overall, we're going to get some updates on EIP 4844. And so much news is coming right after we talk to some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible. Learning about crypto is hard. Until now. Introducing MetaMask Learn, an open educational platform about crypto, Web3, self-custody, wallet management, and all the other topics needed to onboard people into this crazy world of crypto. MetaMask Learn is an interactive platform with each lesson offering a simulation for the task at hand, giving you actual practical experience for navigating Web3. The purpose of MetaMask Learn is to teach people the basics of self-custody and wallet security in a safe environment. And while MetaMask Learn always takes the time 
time to define Web3 specific vocabulary, it is still a jargon free experience for the crypto curious user. Friendly, not scary. MetaMask Learn is available in 10 languages with more to be added soon, and it's meant to cater to a global Web3 audience. So are you tired of having to explain crypto concepts to your friends? Go to learn.metamask.io and add MetaMask Learn to your guides to get onboarded into the world of Web3. Arbitrum 1 is pioneering the world of secure Ethereum scalability and is continuing to accelerate the Web3 landscape. Hundreds of projects have already deployed on Arbitrum 1, producing flourishing DeFi and NFT ecosystems. With the recent addition of Arbitrum Nova, gaming and social dApps like Reddit are also now calling Arbitrum home. Both Arbitrum 1 and Nova leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum and provide a builder experience that's intuitive, familiar, and fully EVM compatible. On Arbitrum, both builders and users will experience faster transaction speeds with significantly lower gas fees. With Arbitrum's recent migration to Arbitrum Nitro, it's also now 10 times faster than before. Visit Arbitrum.io where you can join the community, dive into the developer docs, bridge your assets, and start building your first dApp. With Arbitrum, experience Web3 development the way it was meant to be. Secure, fast, cheap, and friction-free. The Euler story coming to a conclusion. Euler Labs tweets out, ready for an update? Yesterday, after three weeks, the Euler Explorer of March 13th returned all of the recoverable stolen assets to the Euler Dow Treasury. It is one of the largest recoveries in DeFi history. Uh, so $200 million exploited, $200 million returned. Uh, I've, see, I've seen plenty of exploited money being returned back to the original Dow before, but it, not of this size and not nearly close to 100%. Uh, great news. Congrats to the Euler team. I, it's weird to say congrats to this, but I'm sure this is a huge weight off of their shoulders uh, and and also to all of the, the affected users of Euler. Anthony, give, uh, give me your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, this is obviously the best kind of result that anyone could have hoped for uh, by far. I think that initially when I saw this playing out, I said on my own show that uh, I didn't think that the funds would be returned because the hacker was already moving them through Tornado Cash. But it does seem like the hacker or hackers were either identified or close to being identified and they kind of got scared and were like, holy crap, we need to return the funds now or else we're, like, we're screwed um, because they didn't even keep the bug bounty that Euler offered them right they basically said hey you can keep like 10 percent of it or something just just return like the rest of it they didn't even do that and even, and 10 percent of it was 20 million dollars right so uh it, it seems like the um investigations that oil labs and associated parties and and just like uh freelance parties were doing actually paid off and they probably ended up finding out who they were or were very close to it and uh the hackers were like you know this isn't worth it let's just return everything and i don't think oil labs is going to be pursuing legal action and anymore uh on on this front um but someone else still might right the uh if if they know the identities and they pass that on to law enforcement law enforcement might still want to do it uh at the end of the day so you know who knows but the positive thing is the only thing that really matters at the end of the day is that uh, pretty much all the funds were returned and there is also a proposal now or not a proposal like a a breakdown of how they're actually going to be returned to users so people should be made whole very very soon yeah, so uh, Euler continues to tweet out, all energy has now been turned to making sure affected users mm -hmm. can claim back their share of the recovered assets as soon as possible. Uh, the claims calculations are not necessarily simple and a little bit more patience will likely be needed before assets can be claimed by their rightful owners. A proposal will be published shortly, including an outline. Questions, thoughts, and contributions regarding the claim process should be posted on the Euler forums. Um, my mind is like, it's, it's two things. One of two things happened with this exploiter. Uh, one, they found who that person is and they say, Hey, we are going to come with the full force and might of legal agencies and throw you in jail as long as possible. Or the exploiter felt really bad and returned it. I'm going to go with the first one. <laughs> mm -hmm, I think mm -hmm. the, they're like exploiting $200 million on the internet, even with the best, like VPNs and uh, Tornado Cash and like ZK Tech, even using all of that tech to the best of your ability, you're going to leave a trail. And I think this mm -hmm. this effort really tilts power to the hands. It already was, but really exemplifies how much power is in the hands of people like the non-exploiters. The, the as an exploiter, you don't have that much power, even if you exploit hundred million dollars, two hundred million dollars, five million dollars. The trail that you leave, the data that you leave, 
is going to be enough for people to find you. And so just don't do it. Just don't do it. Mm-hmm. Just like be do mm-hmm. a be, do bug bounties. Unless you're do, a nation white state stuff. that doesn't care. Unless like you're North, North Korea. Korea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they don't give a shit if they get caught, right? But that's a bit of a different situation. Yeah. Um, moving on. Um, retroactive public goods funding number two. If you are not familiar with retroactive public goods funding, it is kind of the new frontier of grants giving in the Ethereum ecosystem specifically for public goods. Uh, So this is out of the Optimism Project. This is one of their big experiments with uh, funding public goods and DAO governance at large. Uh, And so we now have the results of the second retroactive public goods funding. Um, And so here on the screen in very tiny text, because so many people got a bunch of money, we can see uh, where a lot of uh, like, I think something like $20 million got allocated in OP tokens to. Uh, coming in at number one at 8.3% L2 Beat, 7.5% ETH Global, 7.3% Build Guilds, 6.7% Xerox Partex, 6.1% Zach XBT, and it goes on and on and on. Pol- Polenia got 3.2%. Uh, Bankless Academy got almost 2%, so congrats to you guys. Uh, and uh, it, go- it goes and it goes and it goes. Uh, and so this is kind of like Gitcoin, but when it- with a new flavor and a new style. Uh, and so many. This people- is like Gitcoin on steroids, though, Gitcoin given the amounts, steroids, yeah. right? Um, like back in the Gitcoin grants that uh, days of when, um, uh, in the earlier days, like this was, I guess, something that only people could only dream of because you're you're giving the percentages, um, but the actual amounts here and then translate to dollar amounts are huge on this because mm-hmm. the OP token is worth over two dollars. So if L2B got two hundred fifty thousand tokens, they got half a million dollars, right? right. Um, and, and then individuals like Zach XBT got almost 200,000 tokens, which is for, like almost $400,000. You mentioned uh, uh, Polonia, 100,000 tokens, it's $200,000. Like these are really big amounts that have been given for past work um, that, that, that have been done in the, uh, in the uh, crypto Ethereum ecosystems. And this is just the educational one. There are two mm-hmm. other categories oh, yeah. that got a lot of tokens as, as well. And this is a tiny portion of the total tokens that are allocated there's 800 million op tokens in total allocated to these rounds right and this was only a 10 million op token round so there is still plenty of tokens left for future Mm -hmm. rounds and if the op price maintains around two dollars that's huge amounts because it's not like this was only distributed to a small set of of projects. This was distributed to 170 something projects so a lot Mm -hmm. of love was spread around here which is just yeah it's amazing to see yeah, protocol. I, I didn't even realize that. I was just looking at the education section. So here, yeah. we, are, here we are in infrastructure. Protocol Guild got uh, 15% of infrastructure tokens. So I guess percentage doesn't even matter now. Uh, protocol Guild well, over got, a million dollars worth. Yeah. Yeah. 557,000 OP tokens. So like one, $1.2 million. Geth. Mm-hmm. Geth. We, we, we funded Geth. We funded Geth. Yep. That's so crazy that yep. we funded Geth, the the execution client of the Ethereum Layer One, now also Layer Two, uh, or excuse me, now also Ethereum Two, which is blasphemy to, to use that terminology. Um, Solidity, <laughs> uh, Lighthouse, Gorly, all of these clients, these open source Ethereum clients that are Ethereum got funding, in like famously always having a funding problem. Op Craft, the Minecraft using the Op Stack got funding. Uh, it's a safe Gnosis wallet got funding. Uh, and man, this is, it is really, really cool. And th- this goes back to just like one of the big core reasons why I'm here in this space is human coordination and funding open source. Um, the bull case for this whole thing is like being able to give, uh, financial rewards to open source public goods things. Uh, and so optimism mm-hmm. is really just leading the charge here and, and putting a lot of money into corners of the internet that previously would not have been able to get it. So if this interests you, if you have something of value that you are building and you think that you could use some grant funding to continue doing that thing because it's open source, it's a public good, something of this nature, make sure you sign up for OP grants, public good funding round number three, because that is eventually coming. I'm not 100% clear on how this all works, but I don't think you can necessarily sign up for it. There is a bunch of uh, Optimism governance delegates. I think there's like 80 of them that uh, nominate projects and mm-hmm. then uh, they all vote on it and that's how it's all weighted. So I don't think you can necessarily quote unquote sign up. Someone has to nominate you. But if you're visible enough, if you're doing uh, good enough work, you could possibly 
you know, post something somewhere and say, hey, like this is all the work that we're doing. Please consider us for for this round sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not like Gitcoin grants where everyone puts right. their own grant up there and then the, it's, it's a different kind of way of doing things. And um, also just one other note here as well. The, the, the As I said, I, I believe there's 800 million OP tokens being allocated to this, which is a huge chunk of the supply. I believe it's uh, it's like, what, 20% of the supply or something? Like It's something crazy, right? Um, imagine a public company doing that. Like when a company goes public, right, in the in the real world, imagine them allocating 20% of their shares to the, I don't know, whoever builds on them, the ecosystem around them, whoever, whoever creates educational tools for them. It doesn't really work for, I think, centralized companies. I think it works extremely well, obviously, for decentralized protocols because you have a, such a, a broad ecosystem that can build around it and on top of it and are incentivized to do so for different reasons. So that that that's why this is such a huge deal because it is a large amount of, of money that, is, is, and, and a really cool thing is that it's actually subsidized by the market. The market, people buying OP tokens is the reason why OP is worth so much. So mm -hmm. like it, it, people, some people say, oh, it's printed out of thin air. It's like, yes and no. It is printed out of thin air, but but people are paying for it. So it's not like it's just money that's not worth anything. People are actually paying for it. There's liquidity there. So it's it's actually really cool. Re, it's, it's basically regenerative finance, redirecting mm -hmm. speculators to public goods. And I think that's what excites me most about it. Yeah, degen to, to regen, certainly. Yeah, and exactly. It's, yeah, it's, it's, yep. it's been uh, my almost like both my investment philosophy and also reason for being in crypto that the ecosystem that has the best public goods infrastructure wins. Which yes, country 100%. has the best bridges, the best airports, the best roads, the best sewage, the best like water piping? That country is going to be able to foster development and innovation and quality of life better than a different country that doesn't have that same sort of emphasis. And so this is just the beauty of crypto is that public infrastructure, public goods, the quality of that public goods increases the upside and financial returns of the things that we invest in. And so this is why like Optimism's retroactive public goods funding effort is both good for humanity and also really bullish. At least that's my take. I'm mm -hmm. also an advisor to uh, Optimism because I believe in this stuff. Okay, Anthony, I'm going to need your help to walk me through this one. But there was some interesting uh, interesting new events in the world of MEV on Flashbots where a, a rogue validator, this is a tweet from Mudit Gupta, uh, rogue validator on Flashbots exploited other MEV bots. And so stole, stole? I want to ask you if this is the right word to use. Stole $25 million from an MEV bot. And this MEV bot, what they did is they tried to do a sandwich attack which is a normal, pretty frequent thing to happen on Uniswap. Like 50 sandwich attacks have already happened since you've listened to this episode. The idea is someone comes in, buys a token on Uniswap. Because they bought that token on Uniswap, they moved the price 1.5%. An MEV bot sees that. And so they buy the token ahead of the person buying, uh, again, ahead of the person who's just going to just ape in. And then they sell the those tokens that they just bought to that person at the 1.5% higher price, and then they sell the tokens on the other side. And so the MEV bot can uh, capture and pocket that arbitrage basically. And they just, they just uh, reduce the optimum execution price for this person just making a market buy, and they're able to pocket 1.5%. Um, so this is the a normal occurrence happens all the time. It's maybe even happened since I just started talking about the sentence. But what is new here is that a validator took the sandwich bundle from an MVV bot, which is how this works, it bundles up transactions and replaces the victim transaction with its own that exploited the MEV bot and managed to seal $25 million. Never before done, but use the Flashbot protocol to, to get this done. And so now I think the con concern here, and correct me if I'm wrong, Anthony, is that any validator who's processing a block has this ability to do this uh, if there is a sandwich attack bundle in the block that they propose. And that is the new concern here. Or at least maybe that's only true inside of the Flashbots uh, sidecar protocol. Can you explain this? Uh, anything I missed here? Yeah, I mean, there's there's actually a bit to unpack here. Uh, so, so basically, so 
maybe just to, to explain how this all works um, from a more basic level. So Flashbots is a company that developed a software called MEV Boost. Now the MEV Boost software is used by about nine, well, it's 90% of validators talk to the MEV Boost software in order to build their blocks uh, for them or external, it's called external block building. And there are a bunch of relayers that uh, you can connect to as a validator and it'll build your block uh, that way. And um, this exploit that happened was an exploit in the MEV Boost Relay software that allowed this to happen. Now, this has actually since been patched, uh, but the patch has also led to its own negative consequences. But the patch, uh, from my understanding, should make this impossible to do now. So you, you won't be able to do this again. This was actually just a one-off kind of exploit, and then uh, it's, it's been patched. But at the same time, what the validator did was actually punishable by the pro by the Ethereum protocol. So this validator itself has been slashed. Uh, it got it got mm. slashed. It lost uh, one ETH in the uh, in slashing for proposing uh, two blocks, basically double signing, uh, proposing the same block twice. Uh, and the thing is, is that that didn't actually work to dissuade them because losing one ETH to profit $25 million obviously is uh, is a good trade, right? Uh, but yeah, as you say, any validator can can do this exploit, but the exploit itself, as far as I can tell, uh, isn't possible anymore. Now, the patch that um, Flashbots introduced for the Relayer software to prevent this from happening, as you can see here from Mariano's tweet, actually, uh, unfortunately, makes it more, um, more difficult for solo validators to propose blocks and it makes the it makes it so that there's a higher chance of them missing their block proposal which means that overall effectiveness of the network goes down um, and what this means is that there's more missed blocks on the network overall uh, and and that uh, leads to network degradation now it's not that big of a concern I think it increased it by maybe two percent so far um, over time that may go up uh, as just more solo validators miss blocks right? because they may be running low powered hardware. Uh, and if they're talking, if they're outsourcing their block building to to a relayer, it adds uh, extra light, this patch adds extra latency to that. And then because they're a solo validator on, on lower powered hardware, it, they could lead, it could lead to a late block or, or a missed block. Um, so yeah, the, the patch itself, uh, the initial patch uh, has led to this, but I think there's even, um, uh, there's another patch coming or there's more work being done to to help a lot, help this along as well. But yeah, this wasn't an exploit of the Ethereum protocol. This was an exploit of uh, the MEV Boost Relay software that did not account for this because essentially in the MEV world, I think most people assumed that validators wouldn't engage in this behavior, that validators would essentially just play by the rules where it, that, that, that's not the case. Right. Um, and, and if you're a solo validator, a single validator has a chance to produce a block, a, 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 a really low chance, but it should on average produce a block every three months. I think these validators were spun up a few weeks ago. So it got, it got lucky, but there wasn't just one validator that was spun up. There was multiple ones that this, this attacker spun up. So it fell into the, the amount, of time that you would expect for this validator to propose a block. And obviously, if it had happened on one of the other validators, they would have done this exploit on those. So they were prepared for this attack. This was a, a premeditated, you know, right. maybe months in advance attack. And they're like, we all we need to do is be able to propose a block and then our exploit will go through and we'll, we'll profit this amount of money. Um, now, I don't know if I'd use the term stole. I don't know if, if steal is the right word because generally people really hate uh, the um, MEV bots that sandwich attack uh, because mm -hmm. it's such a toxic form of MEV. But technically it, it is stealing because you took money from, you, you know, took money that wasn't yours, so to speak. But a sandwich attack is still money from users by taking money that's not theirs as well. So it's like, it, it's kind of like, uh, it, it's funny how the, um, the diff how it's a different way of thinking about it. But yeah, that's the general gist of, of what happens. So I think that the clearest thing I want people to be on, uh, sorry, the people, thing I want people to be clearest on is that this was an exploit, not in the Ethereum protocol, but in the MEV boost software, which most validators talk to, which is another problem in of itself. Like this MEV boost sidecar software is, is not great for a number of reasons and is only necessary because of, of MEV being such a big thing. But there are a lot of initiatives in place to uh, basically obsolete MEV Boost. One of them is called PBS or Enshrined PBS, I should say, uh, Proposed Builder Separation, which is basically taking the MEV Boost software and saying, let's just stick it into the core protocol right. so that this isn't just some sidecar software. It can actually just work as part of the core protocol. Um, but MEV Boost uh, being a sidecar software is really great for testing it out and, and, and informing PBS designs because now we know that 
validator is actually going to engage in this behavior. So we have to design around it and we have to make sure that they can't do this. So there's a lot of moving parts to it, but hopefully that summarizes most of it for people. But if, you know, if people don't understand it, it's fine. This is a, it's a very complex topic overall when it comes to MEV. Yeah, certainly. And if uh, this subject matter uh, intrigues the listener, we did an episode with Matt Cutler from Block Native talking about the supply chain. Very good chain episode. Yeah, of, I remember that one. Yeah. yeah, super good episode. And so you can get a, a full unpack of the whole supply chain of this and also how PBS will eventually become a part of the Ethereum protocol. I will say whether or not you want to call it stealing, uh, I think it's more or less informed by the fact that the person that did this, the validator that did this, funded their wallet via Aztec, a privacy tool. So it's kind of like an admission of guilt. Like you came in with privacy <laughs> tech. Like you know, that's you know what you that's were That's a doing. dangerous thing to say, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a good point. I, I will accept that. Well, but yeah. Well, not that not you're that implying that the only reason people use privacy tools is to commit crimes. <laughs> That's no, what so you just like, said. okay, so the 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 wallet that funded this that that did this exploit, they've done one thing, which is fund this validator yeah, out, of, yeah, yeah, out yeah. of Aztec. If I if I if it was another wallet that was like trading NFTs and then uh, like trading on DeFi and then used Aztec, I was like, oh, that's a just normal use of Aztec. But the this one validator funded their wallet with Aztec to intentionally obfuscate where the money came from. I think that's like kind of an admission of guilt. Yeah, but that's if you think that what they did was stealing, right? Right. Yeah. Cause maybe they don't think what they did was, was actually uh, stealing. Right. Uh, maybe they, they thought just, what they were doing was a highly profitable trading strategy. Right. I, <laughs> and yeah. they just didn't want people knowing who they were. <laughs> it, that's what I'm, that's why I'm saying. It's funny. Like when you get into that, that discussion right. with people, cause people will have different views on mm -hmm. it. Uh, but yeah, I, I get what you're, I get what you're saying about funding it via a privacy protocol. Um, but, but generally, yeah, I, I think that it just depends who you ask really. There's no kind of, I guess, hard law or hard fact around it. I think it, it, it that does depend on people's different uh, opinions on it. Right. A, a sandwich attack from Uniswap will rob a, a victim of like 1.5%. And that is, some people interpret that as theft. This robs someone of $20 million. Yeah, <laughs> the yeah, yeah. The numbers are a little exactly. different here. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Uh, Peter, Peter Siglazi, he's uh, one of these open source core devs who uh, works on Geth, tweets out, um, synthetic stress test for my 4844 blob transaction pool, attach zero to four blobs to every inbound transaction on mainnet and dump it into the blob pool. What this really means is uh, Peter here is stress testing the throughput of a post Ethereum 4844 world. He said the result is 10 gigabytes worth of pending transactions at a churn rate of 150 per block, uh, 80 milliseconds hit after block processing, negligible RAM usage, CC Jesse Pollock of Coinbase. Cezel, Anthony, can you interpret this for me? Uh, yeah, yeah, so, I mean, you, you, I think you got it. He's stress testing what uh, what an Ethereum network looks like when uh, AIP 4844 or blob style transactions are hitting the network. He's seeing if Geth can handle it without significantly bumping up its RAM usage or hardware usage uh, and its latency as well, which is critically important. I was, as I was discussing before, latency is very important for validators because you wanna be able to propagate the block uh, uh, to the network um, in a timely fashion. Blocks are only 12 seconds. So obviously, if it takes longer than that, you're going to miss a block uh, and that's not going to be great for anyone. So it's very promising seeing this because Geth has traditionally, I think, been one of the the most maybe hardware hungry of the execution mm. layer clients. So if Geth is able to do this like uh, with low with the same hardware requirements and, and negligible increased um, RAM usage here, then the other clients should as well. But it also points to the fact that like 4844 is just making such amazing progress and we should be on track to be get this delivered by uh, in the next upgrade, which is called Cancun. Hopefully by the end of the year, um, th this is the one that's coming after Chappella, which is due in a few days. So yeah, just very promising developments happening here. Uh, OpenSea Pro is now introduced uh, long a while ago. OpenSea acquired Gem, uh, an NFT aggregator, and they have done a rebrand into OpenSea Pro. Uh, and so that is now up and running. And Argentine Airline is issuing tickets as NFTs on a blockchain that you can transfer to someone else and they can use that ticket, which is pretty crazy. Uh, and so you buy the ticket from them. There's no uh, tr additional fee from just buying the ticket, but then this airline uh, collects 2% on any time one of these NFTs is traded, transferred, and then whoever wants to redeem this for an actual flight can do so. 
kind of crazy. Uh, MicroStrategy now owns one out of every 150 Bitcoins that's ever in existence. That's a tweet out of, uh, out of uh, uh, Bitcoin Magazine. And something, and I'll pause here for your take, Signature Bank, uh, turns out was a service provider for Tether and actually gave Tether an inroad into the American United States onshore financial system, which gives us perhaps some increased indication as to why perhaps Signature Bank was uh, more under the crosshairs of regulators and the FDIC and the Fed than than other banks. Anthony, any take on any of mm -hmm. that news? Yeah, I mean, uh, the Bitcoin news uh, with Sailor owning one out of, uh, or MicroStrategy, I should say, which is basically Sailor, owning one out of every 150 Bitcoin. I don't actually think this is a good thing at all. I don't think it would be a good thing for any crypto network that's trying to be decentralized. This just points to extreme wealth concentration. Imagine uh, if someone in the, I guess, USD ecosystem, I don't know if that's the correct term, uh, was able to own, uh, you know, the, a huge chunk of uh, the USD supply, right? Like, a, like and, and they do, and, and it leads to a lot of negative consequences and it leads to a lot of wealth inequality I think for people. Um, so yeah, I don't actually consider this to be a, a good thing um, for a number of different reasons. One of them being the the perception of it being, uh, you know, a, a lot of unequal wealth uh, going on there. But that that's just generally my take on that. And then the, the signature bank stuff, um, look, Tether obviously, people have a lot of opinions on Tether and they have had that for years. And it's obviously not something that US regulators are a fan of because they don't have much visibility over it. So if they saw that Signature was servicing Tether in any way that was relatively large, they probably use that as justification for going after after Signature because or one of the reasons. They probably looked at it and like, wow, well, okay, Tether's this shady, dodgy thing that we don't have much oversight on and signatures servicing them. Well, we're going to shut you guys down because we don't like this, basically. So there could have been a bit of that, but it, it's very hard to tell because this stuff isn't public yet, at, at least. Um, and you need to submit freedom of information requests in the US to get this information and you're never guaranteed to get it either because of one reason or another. So yeah, it, a lot of it is speculation, but I mean, it's, it's no secret that the US regulators don't like Tether. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Uh, ZK Sync had its first outage. Uh, the ZKC Parrot <laughs> network experienced downtime from 1.52 to 6.02 a.m. Uh, Central European time. Uh, the team identified the cause, resolved the issue, and the system is now healthy and back online. And then they issued a post-mortem uh, after they had some time to, to uh, look at what actually happened. So TLDR, the fix took five minutes, they say. Uh, the monitoring of uh, what, with what happened has significantly improved. Uh, they say, remember, ERA is an alpha and decentralizing the sequencer is, of course, the long-term goal. And so just to really uh, do the, the TLTR as to what happened here, uh, the database for the block queue, the queue for ZK Sync blocks failed, causing the block production to halt. The database health alert did not trigger because it could not connect to collect all its metrics. Despite this, the server API remained unaffected. Transactions continued to be added to the mempool and queries were served normally. They have comprehensive monitoring, logging, and alerting in place across all components. However, since API was functional, none of them were triggered. It's a challenge to predict and cover all edge cases all at once as situations like no blocks for a while can actually be quite normal. At the time of the incident, the entire team was together at an offsite. Uh, while the team is usually distributed, the engineers online in various time zones around the world. In this case, it was 2 a.m. for everyone when the problem occurred. However, the fix was implemented within five minutes, they say. Uh, they've assigned a special role to our database monitoring agents, enabling them to connect to the database and continuously gather metrics, even during database issues, similar to the ones that they experienced at the time. Uh, and they have done some other things as well, which are like database stuff that kind of goes over my head. Anthony, what's your take? So two main takes here. One, I mean, this is the pitfalls of centralization, right? Where if you're centralized with one sequencer and, and there's like a centralized team managing it, it goes down, it goes down. There's no way to, to, to get around that. Whereas decentralizing the sequencer, let's say there were 10 different entities running a sequencer each, right? Mm -hmm. If five of them went down, it wouldn't matter. There's still five processing the transactions. And, and that's the beauty actually of, of L2s or one of the, the cool things about L2s is that you actually only need one of them. So if nine of them went down and one was still processing the transactions, uh, you would it would still be fine. You wouldn't you probably wouldn't even notice that anything was wrong, right? Mm -hmm. And then two in contrast in to layer ones, which needs two thirds of them to be online. 
Yeah. Well, yeah. Exactly. I mean, it depends on on which layer one it is, right. and depends on what, uh, what 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 how they operate. But yeah, it's it's one third or two. I mean, so yeah, it can be one third or or uh, for it to be online for the the stuff to be processed, two thirds for finality on Ethereum. I mean, mm-hmm. as I said, it's different per per network. It just depends on on what yeah. system they're using. Um, but then secondly, in a in a properly constructed L2 that has an exit to L1 functionality, even if all the sequences are down, you can still exit to L1 on the L1. So you would be able to use the Ethereum network to interact with or Ethereum layer one network to interact with the L2 contract in order to uh, withdraw your funds, even if all the sequences were offline. And that can be done today with Arbitrum. Um, I don't know about Optimism, but I know for a fact Arbitrum has an, an exit on L1, uh, which means that even if the Arbitrum sequencer never came back online, you would still be able to get all your funds back by uh, doing the transaction on L1, like a normal transaction that you would do which is the power of L2s. And this, again, speaks to what you were just saying about how this is very different to an L1 going offline. And L1 going offline means that literally everything built on top of it no longer functions. There is no mm-hmm. way to get your money out. If the L1 goes offline, your money is basically stuck. You can't withdraw. There's no transactions being processed. You, you can't send your funds to an exchange to sell them for fiat or whatever, right? Whereas with an L2, properly constructed L2 that has an exit on L1, uh, it, you know, the L2 can go offline. It doesn't affect any of the other L2s, right? In terms of operation, it doesn't affect the L1 and you can exit to the L1. So that's why Ethereum L1 focuses a lot on on liveness and how you get um, liveness and and you know high uptime is by uh, limiting the um, the amount of hardware that's required to run the infrastructure of of the of the chain and uh, limiting how much transactions per second the layer one can do, which obviously results in high fees. But this is the whole kind of uh, modular roadmap that Ethereum is going through for scaling, where keep the L1 uh, decentralized uh, with really really good liveness by keeping hardware requirements low by you know sacrificing TPS at L1 and, and scalability at L1 but get massive scalability at L2 with uh, with those nice properties of being able to exit to L1 if you need to yeah Anthony I think you've seen my um, my fighting with uh, the Solana and Avalanche communities on Twitter <laughs> these days and they claim that yeah. uh, that we me and, and other people they would probably include you here is that we don't hold our own layer twos to the same standards that we hold other layer ones because when Solana and Avalanche go down, all the Ethereum people are like, this is why you use Ethereum. Uh, do you agree with that take? What's your take about that take? I mean, I, I think that it's it's a kind of funny take because I think that the L2s are competing with these kind of monolithic L1s like Solana in terms of uh, competing for uh, execute on the execution side of things, ex- executing transactions. But at the same time, I wouldn't compare an L2 to an L1 on the liveness side of things because it's two very separate things, as I just explained how L2s are very mm-hmm. different to L1s. So even though I think the L2s are competing with L1, uh, monolithic L1s on the execution uh, side of things, on, on executing transactions, on, on getting users and economic activity and all that sorts of stuff, I think that there is still a very big difference between an L2 and an L1 when you're talking about the liveness of the chain or the or, or the way the chain operates. Because as, as I just explained, an L1 is very, very different to an L2. Certainly. And uh, m- moving on to other parts of uh, the ZKC ecosystem, they got $100 million in TVL in the last four days. So... Uh, the growth in DK Sync seems to to not be impacted about this, and also Argent, who I know has been waiting for ZK Sync to ship their e- ZK EVM for a very long time, now has ZK Sync uh, era as as something that you can access inside of Argent. Uh, and so uh, I am very bullish and excited about the frontier of ZK EVMs. I know you are as well. And also, I will add my disclaimer: uh, I am an advisor to Matter Labs, the software company behind uh, ZK Sync. Raises, raises. Okay, ledger, ledger. Everyone's got a ledger these days. I'm, I'm pretty sure. At least I, I got like six of them. Ledger raises 108 million dollars, uh, adding more money in its Series uh, C funding. Uh, and so, uh, no change in valuation, but 108 million dollars back into the bank, into the bank account for Ledger. Uh, congrats on the raise. Uh, Layer Zero raises $120 million at a $3 billion valuation. This was a bull market raise. It's just now being announced like many, many months later, so which is why this like mm-hmm. valuation raise uh, round is insane. Uh, and sometimes this happens just for like legal reasons. Uh, LiFi, uh, Le- Leafy, Leaf, LiFi, is it LiFi? 
I I don't even I go between Leafy and LiFi. I don't know what to land on. <laughs> LiFi, which is a cross-chain bridge DEX aggregator aggregator, uh, has raised seven point five million dollars in a Series A led by CoinFund and Superscript. Uh, also, Anthony and I are angel investors in LiFi at a previous round, so there's disclaimer there. Uh, if you want to use the LiFi cross-chain DEX aggregator aggregator, you can check it out at jumper.exchange. It'll put you from any chain at you want to any token that you want uh, in one big trade. Um, pretty pretty common there, or pretty common UX there. It looks just like Uniswap. Uh, and then lastly, ens.vision, which is kind of just a data aggregation site for the ENS world, ENS domains, uh, just led $2 million in funding round. Uh, one confirmation, I believe, was the lead, along with Mark Cuban, Bology, Super Rare, DYDX, and OpenSea. And those are all the raises of the week. Pretty healthy raise week. Anthony, any takes on uh, all these raises? There's still plenty of money out there that's willing to fund crypto projects, which is obviously pretty cool, pretty bullish generally. I, I think that, as you said, like there are some raises that may seem insane to people, but they were done quite a while ago. And a bull market raise is actually six months into a bear market. So I would consider anything up to like mid 2022 to be a bull market raise. Uh, mm -hmm. So even if the raise was done in like May or June of last year, that I would still consider that a bull market raise because uh, VC tends to have a six month lag to the public markets in crypto. Uh, so yeah, if you see these wild numbers, just know that they were most likely done when markets were mm -hmm. a lot more favorable and the appetite was a lot bigger. But these days, um, from what I've se seen, the valuations on pretty much everything are down a lot uh, mm -hmm. because of the fact that it is a bear market, which is actually a pretty good thing for investors because they're looking at this and being like, wow, okay, I've got all this capital and the valuations are really low compared uh -huh. to what they were in the bull market. This is a better kind of risk re reward return for me. Let's fund this. And that's why you're seeing a lot of things keep getting funded because mm -hmm. there's still a lot of money there to, to, to go into these projects. Yeah, I think a lot of people are more kind of concerned at some of the layoffs that are happening, both in the, the trad Silicon Valley tech world and also some of the bigger crypto companies that are out there. Uh, but man, it's just, in my opinion, it's just a transfer of talent from the big companies to the startups. Uh, and so I think yep, this is overall so. bullish for, for the, the, uh, exploring the frontier of crypto. So speaking of jobs, we got some jobs to talk about. So if you are interested in getting a job, you can go to bankless.pallet.com slash jobs and check out the Bankless Jobs Board where we post as many jobs that we can find out on the crypto frontier, starting with Rise, who's hiring a marketing manager if you are a non-technical marketer person, also a sales development representative for somebody who is an expert in Web3. Uniswap has got a senior product lead, an application security engineer, and a senior mobile engineer. Bankless, that's us, has a senior product designer, another podcast uh, video editor, and also a social growth lead if you want to work at what is, in my opinion, the best company in crypto. Uh, Consensus <laughs> has got a director of engineering. Adidas is hiring somebody who can do global head of Web3 planning and strategy. There are so many jobs that are available here. I only read out the first little bit. Oh my God, it keeps on going. Uh, there's at least 20 jobs here. So if you want to uh, check out the jobs, bankless.palette.com slash jobs. There's also the Talent Collective where you can let the jobs come to you. Uh, so you can post your resume uh, and talk about what your skill set is. Uh, 747 active candidates in the uh, Talent Collective. Uh, and so that is a message to people who are hiring. Go check out all of the talent that have posted their, uh, their post, their profile on the Talent Collective. Bankless, just matchmaking man we're we're matchmaking jobs and people <laughs> tinder Anthony, for jobs yeah yeah matchmaker yeah tinder for jobs uh <laughs> anthony we got some questions from the bankless nation that i want to throw your way as well as a few takes of the week and also the meme of the week but first a moment to talk about some of these fantastic sponsors that make this show possible the phantom wallet is coming to ethereum the number one wallet on solana is bringing its millions of users and beloved ux to ethereum and polygon if you haven't used phantom before you've been missing out phantom was one of the first wallets to pioneer solana staking inside the wallet and will be offering similar staking features for ethereum and polygon but that's just staking phantom is also the best home for your nfts phantom has a complete set of features to optimize your nft experience pin your favorites hide your uglies burn the spam and also manage your nft 
guarantee sale listings from inside the wallet. Phantom is of course a multi-chain wallet, but it makes chain management easy, displaying your transactions in a human readable format with automatic warnings for malicious transactions or phishing websites. Phantom has already saved over 20,000 users from getting scammed or hacked. So get on the Phantom waitlist and be one of the first to access the multi-chain beta. There's a link in the show notes, or you can go to phantom.app slash waitlist to get access in late February. Bankless Nation, we are back with questions from the nation. If you are a Bankless Nation citizen, you subscribe to Bankless, definitely go into the Bankless Nation Discord where we have the weekly roll-up questions where you can get your question answered by myself or Ryan. But this week, Anthony, uh, or you can just ask me a question directly in my Ask Me Anything channel if you so choose. Anthony, first question to you. After the Chappella and EIP4844 upgrades, what protocol upgrade do you think should be prioritized next as the most important and urgent and also why? I think you're the perfect person to ask this question to. What's your opinion, Anthony? <laughs> so I, I go back and forth between two things. So it's between the upgrades that are part of The Verge, which is basically swapping to Verkle Trees and PBS. I'm leaning more towards PBS lately, uh, especially over the last few months. So proposed builder separation, as I discussed before, when we were talking about the MEV stuff, just because I believe that the MEV is, is a, <clears throat> overall pretty negative. Um, and the current system we have in place for fighting back against uh, the negative externalities of MEV isn't great. Uh, relayers, you know, MEV relays, there are a bunch of them, but it's still very centralized. There's not that many of them. And I don't like that we're outsourcing block building to these relayers. <clears throat> uh, so I would say that I probably think PBS should be prioritized, but I don't actually think from what I've seen that, that it would be ready before vertical trees. So I would say the vertical trees probably comes before uh, PBS, but I would prefer to see PBS go live first, but it just, it, it really just depends on the state of the research and development in, in those areas. Great. I agree with all of those, uh, all that response. And that question came from Rocket Poolster. So thank you, Rocket Poolster for that, for that question. I believe that means Rocket Pool. I'm big fans of Rocket Pool here. Uh, next question up coming from Red Panda. Does the ARB token have any utility or fundamental value potential or is it purely for governance? If it is purely for governance, why would we attach much value to it? What's your take, Anthony? Is it just a valueless so governance I token? Uh, no, I think right now, obviously, it's for governance, but in the future, there are other potential ways it can be used. One of the major ones is basically staking to become a sequencer. Uh, and by doing that, you get a share of the fee revenue, fee revenue of the Arbitrum 1 network and the MEV uh, from that's as generated by the Arbitrum 1 and associated uh, networks, even like Arbitrum Nova and things like that. Uh, but yeah, generally, a lot of these things will just start out as governance tokens for legal reasons, to be honest. Uh, and, and I think that over time, the DAO can add whatever utility it wants. Uh, there are some DAOs where they don't really have the power to do that, uh, or at least feel very powerless in doing that, but it just depends. So I would say right now, yeah, your your bet would be, you know, it's a governance token, you're valuing it based on that, but also you're betting or speculating that in the future, it's they're going to introduce these functions, they being the DAO, are going to introduce these functions in order to drive more value to the ARB token. Awesome. And again, if you want to ask questions for next week, Questions for the weekly roll-up is the channel in Discord. Moving on to takes of the week. This is a take from, from Lawrence. This is the primary threat to the American financial system, apparently. And it is a picture of what is elliptic curve cryptography. Anthony, you want to unpack this one or should we just leave that as is? <laughs> I mean, I think it speaks for itself, really. Like uh, the war on cryptography has been going on for a long time. Um, and honestly, if you read the history about it, which I know you've covered a lot extensively in the past and you've read the history about it, there was a pretty small window of time where we actually were able to kind of uh, be successful here. And we were successful at making sure that cryptography wasn't outlawed i guess so to speak but it wasn't it was it was uh, done by a relatively small group of cyberpunks uh, back in the uh, cyberpunk sorry i should say back in the day um but as i said like you've covered this extensively i don't know exactly what it was called but you did it a while ago you read mm -hmm. through before bitcoin uh, the, series yeah mm -hmm. yeah the before bitcoin series and i think for people interested in in you know the war, war on cryptography that happened a few decades ago you should definitely go check that out Second, uh, second and last take of the week. I don't even think this is a take, but I just wanted to, to bring this in to share because I thought it was too funny. Uh, El Chapo Small tweets out, I shit you not, this arrived in the mail today and it is an FTX Visa card. <laughs> I think this was a service that they were they're rolling out at the very end of their lifespan, but uh, 
Somebody just got a debit card from from FTX. <laughs> I, you know what's funny? There's that saying that uh, something's not worth the paper that it's written on. This is literally not worth the paper that, that it's attached to, right? Like, <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, that's that's funny though that this that uh, this was a thing. A great memorabilia, man. Like, I would just keep that in my wallet just to like pull that off. Uh-huh. Like, it's a great conversation starter for the crypto world. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> And to round out the show, Anthony, thank you so much for walking us through all of this news while fearless leader Ryan is off on a vacation. Bitcoin Magazine, uh, for those that don't know, Bitcoin Magazine is uh, led by my former co-host prior to, to uh, Bankless, uh, CK. Uh, they tweet out, tweeted out a pretty good meme. The people who are $30 trillion in debt are giving you a credit score. And this is just like the Spider-Man character just like reading out, very uninspiringly, <laughs> just reading something out on stage. Anthony, what's your take on this meme? This is like pure Bitcoin bait, right? This is what they're <laughs> yes, all about. It really is. Like this is this is, if, it, if there's ever a meme made specifically for Bitcoiners, this is like it, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I always just think it's, it's one thing I will appreciate by the Bitcoiners is that they will pull back the curtain as to like some of the farceness of like modern day society more aggressively than like anyone else. Uh, and sometimes oh, yeah, they do it yeah. with really They're definitely memes. very aggressive and passionate about it, which mm-hmm. leads to these, yeah, good memes, right? This is a scalable way to show people the absurdity of this system, right? So, yeah, yeah I, I think it's a good meme. Yeah, yeah. So next time you get your credit score checked, remember that the, pre- the people, the organizations that control those organizations that did that owe $30 million, kind of like to themselves. Anyways, I digress. That is a conversation for a different day. Anthony, that was an absolute marathon, an hour and 49 minutes. You and I both like to talk. And so thank you for helping us guide. (laughs) Thank you for guiding the Bankless Nation through all of the news and the week. Big round of applause for Anthony Cezano, everyone. Uh, If you like Anthony Cezano and the takes that he's got, he does the Daily Gui, which is a daily newsletter and daily YouTube video updating everything that you need to know about mostly the Ethereum ecosystem and some really good takes on the newsletter as well. Anthony, if people are interested in following you and subscribing to the Daily Gway, where should they go? Just go to Twitter. Um, my Twitter profile has all the links to everything that I'm doing. So my profile is uh, Sassel0x, S-A-S-S-A-L-0x, and they can find me on there. And yeah, I just want to say thanks for having me on and I hope uh, Ryan's software update went well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the breakup is, uh, we're, we're getting over the breakup. He's uh, getting a new uh, software update, so he will be back next getting patched. week. patched. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I look forward to having you back next time that Ryan uh, goes down for his software update, which seems to, you know, semi regularly, maybe twice, three times a year. Uh, thank you so much, Anthony. Cheers. Thank you. See y'all. Bankless Nation, you know the deal risk and disclaimers. Crypto is risky, Ether is risky, but if you've been watching our trad macro videos, everything else is also risky too. Stuff's risky. Uh, You can lose what you put in, but this is the frontier. It's not for everyone, but we are glad you are with us on the bankless journey.